tonight on CBC Vancouver News. 35 Surrey School District staff were tested yesterday and all of those tests were negative. No evidence of transmission after COVID-19 variants are found in seven schools. Also, she reported an on-campus voyeurism suspect to police. Why the UBC student says an officer tried to talk her out of pressing criminal charges and... Let's go see the damage you did, buddy. Yeah? Lecturing a did? lynx. How many chickens did you get? Hey, you got some of our new ones. A BC farmer's hands-on approach to dealing with a hungry visitor. This is CBC Vancouver News. Good evening and thanks for joining us. Health officials called a SNAP news conference this afternoon trying to ease concerns about COVID-19 variants. The fast-spreading variant first reported in the UK has been detected in positive cases at seven BC schools. And as our Premji reports, families and education advocates are renewing their calls for stricter safety measures. Right now, there are at least seven schools in the Fraser Health region with exposures to the more infectious variant of COVID-19 first spotted in the UK and more tests showing exposure to variants of concern. 35 teachers in a Surrey elementary school had to be tested yesterday, all coming back negative. And since the exposures over the weekend, nearly 300 staff and students have been told to self-isolate. The outbreak's renewing a call to tighten safety measures at schools. I think we can handle a better mask mandate here in our region. Right now, elementary school students are not mandated to wear masks in the classroom like they are in high schools. And it doesn't look like they will be for now. Based on what we know about the new variants of COVID-19, I would not recommend a change in our uh, masking recommendation. The Surrey Teachers Association says that's not acceptable and it is calling on the province and school district to steer away from a one-size-fits-all approach to COVID safety rules in BC's classrooms. We should have a regional approach, so if a health authority of the districts in there have higher levels, they can have stricter protocols. But the school district says its hands are tied and it relies on the province to make those decisions. All of the protocols are under the direction of Bonnie Henry and, and you know, uh, Center for Disease Control. And if they change the rules tomorrow, you know, I'm, I'm ultimately a servant and, and, yep, we'll go do that. Asked whether the districts can make changes as they see fit, like making masks mandatory in schools, the province didn't really answer, defending how decisions were made in the first place. We worked very closely again with uh, all, all of the, the, the people who work in uh, across our schools to develop the, 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 the safe restart plan. Provincial Health says it is making changes to testing within the province in light of the variant's arrival in BC, introducing a new screening tool to detect variants of concern within hours instead of just relying on genome sequencing, which can take days to identify a more infectious variant of the virus. In the meantime, Dalglish says new tools are handy, but she doesn't feel they're enough. And I actually strongly recommend that you get tougher in your language, that you look at a regional approach for our area here in Surrey, and that you start listening better to our teachers and our staff about what their needs are. And says if masks don't become mandatory in all Surrey schools soon, she'll hand out free masks herself as part of a campaign in the coming weeks. Zara Premji, CBC News, Surrey. And since last Friday's update, another eight people have died from COVID-19 in BC. Our province's death toll has now reached 1,335. Over the weekend, another 1,428 cases were confirmed as the province's rolling average continues to increase. There are close to 4,600 active cases across the province, the most since the end of January. Hospitalizations up slightly to 223 people. 63 of them are in critical or intensive care. Fraser Health is now casting a wider net on people required to undergo COVID-19 testing. Effective immediately, close contacts of people who test positive for the virus can also get tested, regardless of whether they experience any symptoms. The health authority says it will also start to screen high-risk close contacts in order to identify positive cases more quickly. Testing will also be expanded for specific clusters and outbreak settings. Tracing protocols are also being ramped up. 
A Vancouver man charged for allegedly hosting a makeshift nightclub in his downtown penthouse is now facing a new charge. According to court records, Mohamed Movagatsagi has now been charged with unlawfully purchasing grain alcohol. The 42-year-old was already facing two counts of violating B.C.'s Public Health Act. Police issued more than a total of $17,000 in fines to the 77 people they say were found in the man's 1,800-square-foot penthouse. For violating the Public Health Act, he could be hit with penalties of up to $25,000 and six months in jail. A UBC Okanagan student is accusing an RCMP officer of trying to talk her out of pursuing criminal charges against an alleged serial voyeur on campus. As Rihanna Schmunk explains, the woman says the officer asked her to consider how a conviction might hurt the suspect's future. Taylor caught the man filming her on campus. She was using the bathroom in the commons at UBC Okanagan when she says she saw a white iPhone pointed up at her from under the stall divider. And CBC isn't using her real name. Now, Taylor says she reported what happened to the RCMP. And at first, she says the responding officer told her he would have no problem with charges. She was told the suspect had even confessed. But then she says it got a little bit strange. She says the investigating RCMP officer, Constable Ryan Rowley, started to talk about the suspect, about his good values, his standing as an engineering student with a co-op and a supportive girlfriend. Taylor says the officer told her the suspect had been sorry during his confession and might never be able to get a job if convicted. Finally, she says the officer told her he didn't think the suspect was a risk to reoffend, So she reluctantly agreed to drop the charges. It wasn't until weeks later she said she found out from a different RCMP officer that the suspect had allegedly confessed to filming women in bathrooms at least five times before. And she told me she never would have questioned pursuing charges had she known that sooner. And experts say it's a scenario they've seen in the justice system time and time again. This is a really common thing that unfortunately happens. And it, it's not just sexual assault, it's also women who experience any form of violence. They often are met with skepticism um, and a prioritization on the future of the person who committed the crime rather than on the safety of the people who are experiencing it. Since the second officer took over the case, it's now been sent to Crown. And there's no timeline for how long that will take until they decide on next steps. Constable Rowley did not respond to CBC's request for comment, and the RCMP said it was not in a position to comment on each of Taylor's claims. Rihanna Schmunk, CBC News, Vancouver. A 26-year-old Surrey man charged with second-degree murder in the death of a senior has been found guilty. Pili Pai of Surrey stabbed T. Boar two years ago. The 68-year-old was found badly injured in his home and later died in hospital. Pai didn't have a previous criminal record, but police say he was the subject of a number of negative interactions in the past. Well, the Office of the Police Complaints Commissioner is now investigating after the Vancouver Police Department moved in to clear protesters from a downtown building last week. As Susanna De Silva reports, demonstrators say the force used by police was unnecessary, but the VPD alleges the protesters were the aggressors. Corbin Mack had been part of three days of demonstrations with the indigenous group Braided Warriors at different downtown buildings targeting companies involved with the Trans Mountain Pipeline. He says police actions Friday to clear them were unexpected and unnecessary. One of our arrestees, she said, I'm, I'm taking this time to leave right now. And then they, uh, she was picking up her drums and her medicines and they threw her on the ground. Uh, she sustained injuries to her head. He says he and three others ended up being arrested with several people suffering injuries. We have people with uh, some nerve damage, mild concussions, scratches and cuts, uh, possible fractures or strains in, in various uh, limbs. Videos have been posted online, including one showing a person being grabbed by the hair, an action seen by some as particularly offensive. It is very sacred. Uh, it's, you know... Part of our ancestral DNA is in our hair as well as in our blood. And for the police to attack us in that way, it's attacking our whole culture, our whole way of life. She says she has been part of many protests and not seen that level of force used. They're trained in 
you know, conflicts and in uh, diffusing situations. I didn't see any of that, uh, those tactics being employed at all. But the Vancouver police say that isn't true. Our VPD officers attempted to speak with the protesters and attempted to negotiate them to have them leave the building. Unfortunately, the group did not uh, want to engage. It refused to engage. The department says they then had no choice but to physically remove them after the building's owner had raised concerns about safety. Well, this was a very dynamic situation that unfolded over several hours. Uh, it didn't unfold over 30 seconds. They were committing a mischief by being there and we were simply attempting to do that when unfortunately things did um, uh, take a turn for the worse when uh, one of the protesters uh, did become violent and that caused a number of other people to rush in as the police officers were trying to do their job. As for the video with the hair pulling, VPD couldn't comment because it was forwarded to their standards branch and on to the office of the police complaints commissioner who is looking into officers actions on Friday. It's angering to me that the um, the VPD is able to do this. As for Mac, he and four others face charges including mischief. He says they are also considering legal action. Susanna the Silva, CBC News, Vancouver. BC paramedics are sounding the alarm tonight. They say staffing shortages among their employees are affecting their ability to respond to emergency calls during the pandemic. The union is now calling on its employer and the province to act. The ambulance paramedics of BC says last Friday, roughly one quarter of around 120 ambulances in the Lower Mainland District sat idle without enough staff to operate them. That's on a night when overdose calls province-wide hit a high only seen four other times in the history of BC's overdose crisis. The union says the need for more paramedics is clear. We haven't been able to get uh, the PCEHS and PHSA to, to really acknowledge that there is a problem and work with us to move ahead um, um, with short-term solutions and long-term. And it's affecting our ability to respond, <coughs> potentially patient care, and uh, obviously the paramedics' mental health, fatigue. The CBC asked BC Emergency Health Services to confirm the staffing numbers provided by the union. Uh, they didn't comment on those statistics, but do say they've added ground and air ambulances since the start of the pandemic. They've also added staff to support patient care and are actively recruiting more paramedics. And people experiencing homelessness, including residents of the Strathcona Park encampment, will soon have access to two new temporary shelters in Vancouver. The province, in partnership with the city of Vancouver, are opening up a total of 120 beds in the two new locations starting in April. One of those locations, the old Army and Navy site on West Hastings, the other on Terminal Avenue. The new locations are part of the goal of having enough indoor spaces available to decamp Strathcona Park. Experienced staff will be on site 24-7 to support shelter guests. They will provide daily health meals, access to laundry and showers, as well as referral to community and health services. Okay, if you've ever had to scold a cat or dog for making a mess or eating something they shouldn't, you might want to listen up here. Yes, a BC man used a firm and strict voice with an unwanted visitor to his chicken coop over the weekend. But as the CBC's Dan Burrett explains, this was no domesticated pet. Let's go see the damage you did, buddy. Yeah, should we go see the damage you did? That is not a house cat. How many chickens did you get? Hey, you got some of our new ones. Chris Paulson caught this lynx making a meal of his feathered flock in his chicken coop on Sunday near Decker Lake, west of Prince George. Not good, is it? No. Yeah, no, it's not good. But the farmer didn't raise a gun or even his voice. He grabbed them by the back of the neck uh, where, their, where their mothers like to pack them around and pick them up if they're, if they're being rowdy. This lynx got a lecture instead. Let's go have a look at this damage. There's one. See how upset you made everyone? There's two. That's two of our new chickens. Paulson says lynx are usually not a problem, and this skinny cat was keen on a meal, not him. We drove him out as far as we could and, and let him go. And left the lynx the two chickens he killed, named Frida and Birdie. Paulson says he's dealt with more dangerous critters than this. We had an owl come in just a few weeks ago and uh, take about six chickens. 
and I've been a lot more scared of roosters than I than I was of, of this guy. Paulson says his children will miss the chickens, but were kind enough to give the lynx a new name, Tough Nut. Though if you find a lynx in your hen house, I probably wouldn't recommend doing that for anybody else. Neither do conservation officials who caution you should never take on a lynx. Did, <laughs> Lecture or not. Dan Burrett, CBC News, Vancouver. The way the lynx <laughs> is just <laughs> sitting there, or, you know, while he holds, it's just incredible. He's totally listening. Yeah, so Sam says, I don't, try, don't yeah. try this at home, right? Yeah, <laughs> Yeah, that was a good disclaimer at the end. And I, the lynx's face just says it all. Yeah. Like, yeah, I, I did that. Like, if there was a couch, he would hide his hand under it, like my dog does when he eats something he shouldn't. Yeah, what a great story. R.A.P. Frida, but uh, tough nut. <laughs> is a tough one. Uh, we've got a, a decent forecast for uh, whoever's out and about tonight. Uh, we've got a few uh, strikes of uh, lightning showing up, though, across the south coast. That's where I want to start. Let me take you right to the satellite and radar. Reports of lightning across the island, and you can see them showing up. Uh, I've got the lightning detector on up towards uh, the Sunshine Coast. We're hearing reports of lightning and some hail in Hope and uh, down on the west side of the island as well. So this is just thanks to this westerly flow, getting some convection and then uplift as those uh, winds converge with the mountains. So a little stormy out there for parts. I don't think we'll see anything or any action in through uh, Metro Vancouver, but this westerly flow will keep the risk of showers in for us through the overnight and Tuesday morning. So taking you through the forecast, just keeping that slight risk of some moisture for Metro Vancouver, better chance uh, that we'll stay dry, but I've got to keep the risk in through the morning. Letting this run though through Tuesday, this is 8, 9, 10 a.m. And look at that, clearing skies. I've got a good looking Tuesday and Wednesday in the forecast. I'll take you through to the rain though, coming up. Oh boy, the rain again. All right, thanks Joe, talk to you in a bit. You're welcome. Well, he was the first black person elected to public office in this province. And he helped guide BC into the Confederation of Canada. But the life and legacy of Mifflin Gibbs remains somewhat of a mystery. As Ashley Moliere reports, it's partially because black history isn't mandated in BC's school curriculum. Growing up in BC, I barely had the chance to learn about local black historical figures. And as someone who is part black, it's important for me to see that representation because black people helped make BC what it is today. So for Black History Month this year, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to learn about one prominent black pioneer, Mifflin Worcester Gibbs. Mifflin Gibbs was born in Philadelphia as a free black man in uh, 1823. And he landed in San Francisco, 10 cents in his pocket. At that point, they realized that the state of California didn't like black people at all. And they decided that the whole community should move. Turned out they had an invitation from Sir James Douglas in Victoria, and they went up, took a look. It was great. They loved it. Speaking with Crawford, I learned that Mifflin was a man of many firsts. His store in Victoria was one of the first competitors for the Hudson's Bay Company. And in 1866, he was the first black person elected to public office in what is now B.C. He also helped with something even bigger. He was elected in the 1860s to the, what was called the Yale Convention. This was a meeting of people from Vancouver Island and all of British Columbia who were getting together to decide if Canada forms a confederation, do we join it and on what terms? So Gibbs was very active in thrashing that out. Today, Gibbs doesn't have any family still living in BC but his great, great, great grandniece came to Victoria to unveil a bronze plaque dedicated to Gibbs in Irving Park in 2019. In another conversation we had, you mentioned that Mifflin was like this force in your life and someone you looked up to. Why is that? There was a big thing about perseverance and just the things even that he uh, had to go through when he came to Canada. And so I would say to myself, if he could do it when times were really bad, then whatever I was confronted with, that I should be able to learn something 
from him. If you look for it, Mifflin Gibbs's legacy can be found all around Victoria today. His plaque in Irving Park marks where he used to live. Just down the street, there's a study room named after him at the local branch of the Greater Victoria Public Library. One of the items that we have. The Royal BC Museum has some artifacts in their archives from Gibbs's time in BC. This document is from the Cowichan District. It shows a parcel of land that he purchased. This is an early copy of Shadow and Light, which is Mifflin Worcester Gibbs's autobiography. This one has an introduction by Booker T. Washington, and it's a signed edition. So with all of this evidence of his significance in BC, why didn't I get to learn about him? And why aren't kids today hearing his story and that of other black pioneers? Uh, they were a big part of the population in the 1860s, proportionally speaking. But by the 1880s, 1890s, uh, there weren't so many. And uh, they didn't have that much influence anymore. They weren't noticed that much. So we forgot. More representation in history classes is something the BC Black History Awareness Society is pushing for. You know, when a black kid goes to school and learns that, oh, a black person was in a position of, of leadership, you know, it really warms your heart. It really makes you feel better and makes you grow a little bit more, you know, and uh, it, it gives you self-confidence, right? So all those little things are important because they make you a stronger person. Thinking back to the few times I had the chance to learn about black historical figures who helped change the world, it filled me with pride. It reinforced the idea to keep going, to work hard, and to fight negative stereotypes. But anything I know about BC's black history, I learned on my own, because it wasn't mandatory for teachers to include that part of history. When you learn about other people's history, it, uh, it reduces discrimination. It reduces the, the barriers of, of, of ignorance and, and, and prejudice. People like Sylvia are working with the Ministry of Education to update BC school curriculum to include more black history but talk stalled leading up to the provincial election. In a statement, the ministry says it's still working with the BC Black History Awareness Society to identify teacher and student resources. It looks forward to working with the group more in the months ahead. Why should students be learning about people like Mifflin Gibbs? I've long believed that if Sir James Douglas hadn't invited the black community to Victoria, the American miners that he knew were coming north to the gold rush would, could he just possibly have annexed all of British Columbia right up to uh, Russia and Alaska. And uh, there wouldn't have been a Canada as we know it if that had happened. Good to know that it wasn't just a bunch of, you know, white guys with funny beards who did everything important in British Columbia. That there were all kinds of people who didn't get any glory, they weren't remembered in you know, anything, but they were here and they made a very big difference to what happened to the rest of us. There's a story about Mifflin I learned through Crawford and Verna. He was in Rochester and he had just finished his speaking tour promoting the abolition of slavery. He was feeling down, so he confided in a friend. Her response, go do some great thing. Well, I think it's fair to say he did go do some great thing, and then some. I hope, especially after a year like 2020, the Ministry of Education continues to work with the black community to include more black people in history lessons so that other black kids are inspired to go do some great things. I'm Ashley Moliere with CBC News in Vancouver. Such a great first-person perspective from Ashley tonight and such an important piece of our history. really is. Uh, the curriculum uh, definitely needs uh, updating, I would suggest. So it's good that they're uh, at least working, uh, working towards that. And a nice history lesson for us uh, right there as well. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And a reminder, you can also watch our newscast live on CBC Gym. CBC Vancouver is also on Facebook, YouTube and Instagram. Well, Parliament votes to accuse China of genocide, but some key names abstain. Their reasoning and the key details of the decision is next.
At 624, thanks for staying with us during our commercial free live stream tonight. Well, large whales are getting entangled in gear in the Gulf of St. Lawrence at a much higher rate than previously estimated. As Paul Withers tells us, a new study found lacerations and rope scars on about half the fin whales surveyed, and it predicts the same for blue whales. In 2018 and 19, researchers used aerial drones to observe fin and blue whales in the Gulf of St. Lawrence. They were looking in an area north of Anticosti Island known as the Jacques Cartier Strait. It produced more than pretty pictures. The uh, encounter rate is very high and worrisome. Researcher Christian Ramp says the drones revealed just how many fin and blue whales are getting caught up and scarred by fishing gear. Drone technology um, is, uh, gives us a complete new perspective um, on those animals where we beforehand could only observe a small part um, of their body above the water. Dozens of individual fin whales were observed. 41% showed evidence of scarring, seven times higher than the rate from ship-based photos. The entanglement rate for endangered blue whales is likely the same. The issue is already a concern in the Gulf of St. Lawrence. Entanglement in fishing gear is a problem not only for white whales and humpbacks, but also for blue whale and fin whales and need further investigation and what, what is the gravity of the situation, how they affect the population size. Ramp is lead author in a recently published study on the research. The study says some entanglements are fatal, but it does not estimate how many whales die as a result. Because of their size, strength, and shape, these whales were thought to be at lower risk from entanglements. Ramp says the study points to the need for more whale-friendly fishing in the Gulf, innovations like ropeless gear, where trap and rope is attached to a buoy on the bottom and released by an acoustic signal from above and then retrieved. I mean, probably the price for lobster and for snow crab might go up because, you know, the fishermen have to make a greater investment for that gear. But so the question maybe for the public is then, are we willing to pay more? The Maritime Fishermen's Union, which represents some harvesters in the area, says ropeless technology is not ready yet. But in the meantime, conservation measures now in place should also help the world's largest whale species that also inhabit the Gulf. Paul Withers, CBC News, Halifax. And we'll be back in a few moments with a controversial vote in the House of Commons today and more on the situation in Myanmar. The House of Commons voted overwhelmingly in favor of an opposition motion calling China's treatment of its Uyghur minority a genocide. It's Canada's strongest public condemnation yet, but as Salima Shivji explains, some notable MPs were absent. Stop the Uyghur genocide! Pressure outside Parliament for a more forceful stance on what's happening in China's Xinjiang province to the Muslim minority Uyghurs. My father was taken to the concentration camp, and after that, I didn't know what's happening, like what happened to them. This is text textbook-style genocide. Adding to the pressure inside. The People's Republic of China has... A conservative motion calling for the House to call it a genocide. The evidence is so overwhelming that we no longer can turn a blind eye. Mounting evidence like witness testimony, satellite photos, and leaked documents. We've become sadly used to hearing the phrase, it's complicated to justify not doing what is clearly the right thing. Only it is complicated for the Liberals, trying to balance support for global human rights with their struggle to manage fraught relations with China. The two Michaels, Kovrig and Spavor, are in their second year of detention, and Beijing is watching, denying a genocide. 
Another complication for the Prime Minister, he's acknowledged that Canada committed genocide against its Indigenous peoples. Justin Trudeau on Friday was hesitant. Um, we're um, still um, reflecting very carefully on the best path forward for Canada. Today, notably absent, along with the rest of his cabinet, leaving it to the Foreign Affairs Minister to say... I abstain on behalf of the Government of Canada. ...with every other Liberal MP free to vote in unison. I vote in favour of this motion. I vote in favour of the motion. I vote in favour of the motion. I declare the motion as amended carried. The motion is non-binding, meaning nothing really has to happen next. But the Conservative leader wants the Liberal move noticed. Their coordinated absence speaks volumes. It speaks also to the only path available to Liberal ministers, simply not voting, with the Conservatives backing the government into a corner on an issue where the Tories see the minority Liberals as vulnerable. Salima Shivji, CBC News, Ottawa. Protesters in Myanmar organized a general strike, the latest sign of anger against the military government there. The military took control earlier this month and arrested national leader Aung San Suu Kyi. As Renee Filippone reports tonight, demonstrators are determined to keep up the pressure. Loud but peaceful, and in some of the largest numbers yet. A nationwide show of solidarity as hundreds of thousands come out in cities across Myanmar, all defying a warning from the military that confrontation could lead to bloodshed. We will close all our shops and come here to protest, says this man. The Civil Disobedience Movement, or CDM, has led to today's general strike. Government employees and professionals alike all joined in an attempt to paralyze the country. It will not be easy, but it is possible. So we, are trying, we, we have to support the CDM. That is the one and only solution to end the detention. Among their tactics, railway workers have used their bodies to block trains, disrupting transportation. Strikes have forced some banks to close. They don't have the capacity. Kin Zhao Wen is with the Myanmar think tank. He says soldiers are filling in for staff, but it's not working. They can't replace the people in the central bank. They can't replace the people in ministries. So they are feeling the pressure. Over the weekend, a face-off turned deadly in the city of Mandalay. The military used live ammunition to disperse crowds, killing two men. And grief poured into the streets of the capital Nepeda Sunday for the funeral of a woman who was shot in an earlier protest. All eyes are now on General Minong Lang, leader of the coup, and how he will deal with the protests and demands to release civilian leader Aung San Suu Kyi and hundreds of others. If he is going to escalate, and if he's going to kill, well, let's say, scores of people on the streets, is he prepared to take the risk? 30 years ago, the generals didn't care. It was a bloodbath in Yangon. You know? This time, I think he has to be a bit more careful. Careful because these young protesters are showing no signs of backing down. They see this moment as their revolution. Renee Filipponi, CBC News, London. Starting today, airline passengers arriving from abroad are subject to Canada's new travel rules. Mandatory testing and spending three nights quarantined in a hotel at their own expense. The new regulations are off to a rocky start as travellers struggle to book their stays. Here's what some travellers in Ontario had to say about the new rules. The stressful part is that you've been mandated to get a hotel. And that is very stressful in the pocket. And the, the price tag is really is really too high. Uh, yeah, I, I have one. I have one, yes. And I like it too good. It's good to, to serve the community, to protect the community. It's it's very good for that. Yes, I'm going to an Airbnb for two weeks. So I don't think it's it's just fair that it's fair for me to pay for a hotel while I already pay for an Airbnb to cover my my quarantine process. Most air passengers will now have to check into a quarantine hotel for at least three nights while awaiting results. Travelers must book their hotel stay before arriving in Canada. Those who test negative can check out immediately and finish their 14-day isolation at home. The goal is to stop the importation and spread of virus variants. The federal government has posted an online list of approved hotels. Several people have complained to CBC News that they've had difficulty booking a room by phone. 
and non-essential travelers coming into Canada by land will also have to comply with a new COVID-19 test at the border. This is in addition to providing a negative COVID-19 test taken within 72 hours of crossing into Canada. Testing will be provided on site at five high volume border crossings or travelers will be given a self swab kit. They'll also be given another test to complete later in the quarantine. Meanwhile, the border between Canada and the U.S. remains closed to all non-essential travel. Despite Oxford AstraZeneca's COVID-19 vaccine having the lowest efficacy rate, new research shows it's proving more effective than initially thought. Vicodopia has more tonight on what researchers are finding. I don't like needles. With a population about the size of Alberta's, Scotland has managed to give one out of every five people at least one vaccine shot. And it's seeing promising results with just that single dose. Four weeks after a shot, the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine was 85% effective at preventing hospitalizations. For the Oxford-AstraZeneca vaccine, it's even higher at 94%. And for those over 80 years old, it was 81% for both vaccines. We're absolutely delighted um, and delighted on, on several fronts. The lead researcher says holding off on the second dose has been worth the trade-off. So trying to prioritize rollout of the vaccine and getting uh, um, the first dose into as many people as possible, as quickly as possible, uh, seems a, a sensible way forward. Israel is also reportedly seeing similar protection. Just one shot was 85% effective at preventing COVID-19 symptoms in hospital staff. Quebec has already adopted the single-dose strategy amid some controversy. Even high-risk people like residents of this long-term care home got just one shot. Today, 23 of them still tested positive, but officials say what matters is the worst off have just mild symptoms. We have cases, we have an outbreak in this long-term care. Uh, the patients are not sick, so very little, uh, very little symptoms, no transfers to uh, hospital care. There's now enough real-world evidence for the rest of Canada to rethink its vaccination plans, according to one of Quebec's top health officials. You will certainly reduce the number of hospitalizations and deaths by uh, deferring the second dose and administering the first dose to as many people as possible. Despite news that Health Canada may soon approve the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine, Canada's vaccination efforts still have a long way to go. Vicodopia, CBC News, Toronto. More than half a million people in the U.S. have now died in this pandemic. And tonight, President Joe Biden marked the moment. He asked Americans to resist becoming numb to the sorrow. We must end the politics and misinformation that's divided families, communities in the country. And it's cost too many lives already. Biden urged people to wear masks, keep their distance, and get the vaccine when they can. At the National Cathedral, the bell rang 500 times, once for every thousand American lives lost to COVID. Well, the Canada Revenue Agency is bracing for a very busy tax season. Coming up, we're going to hear about how the pandemic could complicate your tax return. Ever since the free trade initiative, there has been a lot of talk about relations between Canada and the United States. Well, in Grasmere, British Columbia, it is pretty cozy, at least as far as education is concerned. That's because the local school in that community only goes to grade three. After that, parents must send their kids to another town in British Columbia or across the border. Marlene Trotter has the story. It's just before 8 o'clock in the morning on a regular weekday at the Rooseville border crossing in southeastern BC. Believe it or not, these kids are getting ready to go to school. Without any more formality than that, the students casually cross the border into another country five days a week to begin their school day. The school children come from the small, isolated community of Grasmere, B.C. There's no industry here and no real town. 
Most of the 170 people of Grasmere live in the surrounding ranch country. It's a quiet, peaceful valley in the East Kootenays, just a few kilometers from the American border. When you live in the country, taking a bus to school is just a fact of life. And for these kids, another fact of life is going to school in the United States. Do you like going to school in Montana? I love it. <laughs> How, why? Because there's, all my friends are down there, and I've been going since fifth grade. I don't see a difference. To me, because they're so close, it doesn't seem different to me. The Canadian kids go to school in Montana because it's more convenient. From where they live, it's about half as far as the nearest school in B.C. And because Eureka School District serves a large area of Lincoln County, it's bigger and offers more than the small rural schools in southeastern B.C. There's been trees on the hillside and Canadian kids coming to school for umpteen years, and that's the way it's been in the ten years I've been here. Eureka School Superintendent Ron Blake. It's just something that has grown up over time as what's being the best for the children involved. And the governments have, you know, pretty well kept their bureaucratic noses out of it. In fact, children from Grasmere have been coming to school in Montana for about 45 years. They've never been charged a tuition fee, and even though a few people have complained recently that they're being funded by American taxpayers, the Canadians have always been welcomed into the community. It's considered a fair swap because some kids from Montana go to school in Alberta, and Alberta kids cross the border as well. Kids are kids until this past year when we've had some controversy over it. Uh, hardly anyone has really known, well, who is who? I mean, it hasn't really been important. Here are some of the stories we're following tonight on CBC Vancouver News. I think that it's very good news that the testing that has been done so far has indicated no transmission. 35 Surrey teachers test from schools with variants have all tested negative. Variants have been found in seven BC schools. Meanwhile, health officials say they have ramped up test screenings for variants. BC is now screening 70% of test samples for variants of concern up from about 15 percent in January. A UBC Okanagan student is accusing an RCMP officer of trying to talk her out of pursuing criminal charges against an alleged serial voyeur on campus. She says the officer asked her to consider how a conviction might hurt the suspect's future. The suspect, who she says was filming her from an underneath a bathroom stall last year. Well, today marks the official launch of tax season in our country, the first day Canadians can file returns. The federal government has already warned, though, this year will be unlike any other. And as Senator Thibodeau explains, probably a lot more complicated. Alice Antronikian knows demand for help filling out this year's taxes will be high. She volunteers at a BC senior centre. Yes, you know, they're edgy. They're edgy. The seniors are edgy because there are new government benefits that have to be taken into account. Many considered taxable income. So this is going to be a very busy tax season. Usually we have four to six people who do that. So I'm, I'm not uh, yet, uh, I, I, I'm not aware of how many more we have this year, but we definitely have to increase that number. For instance, many seniors in BC collected the provincial recovery benefit. It's a one-time tax-free payment of up to $1,000. Across the country, anyone who got a provincial or a federal COVID-19 benefit and made less than $75,000 won't have to pay interest on any taxes they owe until next year. You still have to file, but you don't have to pay any amounts owing until April 30th, 2022. To beef up for general questions about tax season, the Canada Revenue Agency's call centre will add staff and has already extended hours. We had over a million calls to our call centers and, and uh, versus 80,000 in the prior year. The CRA is also planning to hire 2,000 additional workers who will be able to help people with their specific account questions, including those about deductions. If you work from home and spent money to do so, you can claim for home office expenses, up to $400. It's a very simple document. You just put, put your estimated amount, as two, it's $2 per day, 
uh, of, of, of deduction and you can calculate your days, but it's, uh, it doesn't require any uh, filing of documents. But the one thing that is back to normal this tax season, the filing date for most people is April 30th. Hannah Thibodeau, CBC News, Ottawa. Still to come tonight, new pictures from Mars as Perseverance delivers once again. And at 644, you're looking at a live shot at Victoria from the Swans Hotel and Brewery. After some rain, the sun has emerged. How long will it be here for its visit? Johanna has your full forecast next. Some early risers in the prairies got a treat today, and it was captured from a variety of angles. A fireball buzzed over the prairies, temporarily piercing the dark sky of the early morning sky with a flash of blinding blue light. This video of what appears to be a meteor was captured in Edmonton about 6.30 a.m. local time. The spectacle in the sky was seen in at least two provinces with scattered reports from Jasper to Saskatoon. Spectacular images. For Very sure. cool. Uh, time for some more. I'll look at some selfies, if you will, from the Red Planet. NASA releasing these spectacular new pictures from the mission to Mars. 
The Perseverance rover beamed these back just moments before it touched down last Thursday. You can see the six-wheeled vehicle hovering just above the surface prior to that landing. It shows the entire vehicle dangling from three cables and clouds of dust being whipped up by the crane's rocket thrusters also there. The rover collected an unbelievable 23,000 images of its descent. Well, I can ask Jill my question because I feel like she'll know the answer, hopefully. <laughs> How often are we going to be getting pictures like this? That, that's a great question. <laughs> hopefully uh, more often than the long weekend wait we had. It was, uh, you know, sort of uh, three days after it landed on Thursday that everyone was anxiously awaiting these high-res photos. Scientists, I was listening to the uh, briefing, uh, said they're going to come much more frequently. But if you haven't checked out that full video, it is pretty cool. And I've got to show you some of my favorite images. Take a look. I sort of captured these from the video. This is uh, the rover on the surface of Mars looking back up at Percy, the space crane, as Mike mentioned, lowering the rover down to the surface in the last few stages. That's something out of a Ridley Scott movie there, very sci-fi. And then I love also a reminder of how much we bring everywhere we go. There's Perseverance landing on the crater, only five meters from where uh, the exact uh, landing spot we wanted. But you can see it left a heat shield, a descent stage, a parachute and back shell just scattered on the surface of uh, Mars. And for anyone watching, there are tons of Easter eggs already in this video. This is on the control panel a nod to the uh, five other rovers, that, or the four other rovers, I should say, that came before. So yes, stay tuned for many more images and video, uh, but, but pretty cool. This is the first time we can imagine what landing on Mars would actually look like. Uh, back to uh, Terra Firma, seven right now at YVR. It was a mild day for us on the South Coast. Uh, YVR hitting 11 for a moment today. We're starting to see our 30-year our seasonals uh, bump up our 30 year average high for this time of the year is nine. So uh, we've got that in the forecast for the rest of the week. Still looking at some instability. This is the current satellite and radar shot. You can see uh, lightning strikes uh, still being detected in the past hour up the Sunshine Coast, uh, looking at a risk for showers across the South Coast tonight. I think we're probably in the clear for many uh, lightning strikes. A uh, long range model taking you through Tuesday. We've got clearing skies that'll keep us going. Through Wednesday, a pretty dry and sunny start to your Wednesday. Increase in cloud and Wednesday night, that's the next weather maker that'll make for a soggy Thursday. We'll be watching those snow levels uh, at this point staying uh, well above the 200 meter mark. Uh, into Friday, it looks like a mixed bag and I'll have to keep my eye on that weekend. A bit of everything at this point and that's showing up in our forecast. Look for a cool Tuesday night into Wednesday. I've got some sunshine in there. At this point, it's just Thursday that looks like a washout and uh, it's only Monday, but I'm already looking at the weekend. Sunday does look soggy. I'll keep you posted. All right, sure. Thanks very much. Talk to you again in a bit. Well, it's a new take on the community library. Just swap the books for branches and the people for dogs. We'll explain what a stick library is next. Do I take this off? Uh, yeah. I'm doing this in the hopes, not for me, but in the hopes that it'll help someone start the process of change or even just to further take the steps necessary to make change within themselves. My name is Jeremy Raven. I am 36 years old and was born and raised in Winnipeg, Manitoba. I needed to change my lifestyle, so I looked at my options and I started searching for ways of getting the help I so desperately needed. I signed up for a program that dealt with childhood traumas, enrolled in counseling sessions, and started doing the work. Prior to this, while incarcerated, I attended a program that helped me connect with second stage sober living houses. After serving two years at Henley Correctional Center, I was released. Upon my release, which was December 19th, 2019, I enrolled in a program called REACT. The program deals with complex trauma, codependency, and boundaries. I also attended counseling sessions that were once a week. I knew I needed to stay busy, so I signed up at the Adult Education Center, where I am currently working on obtaining my education so that I can receive my diploma.
Due to COVID and my lack of education, I've been going through the uncomfortable days dealing with sobriety and life in general. I found a few support groups that I stay connected to as well as I try to volunteer as much as possible to help me stay on the straight and narrow. In the process of all my work, I have found myself and a way for making my dreams fall into place. For me, school was the answer I needed. I put thoughts into action, making this all possible. Letting go of all my unhealthy habits and replacing them with healthy new habits has been the key to my success. I have been soul searching and getting back to my indigenous roots to reconcile with the person I truly desire to be. I have changed my whole outlook on life after going through the uncomfortable transformation from incarceration to sober living, growing through the learning curves of everyday living and connecting with people that are on the same journey as me. I believe in myself and I'm taking the proper steps necessary, making the right choices to be the man I wanna be. In this time period, I have accomplished 14 months of sobriety, completed the REACT program, monthly counseling, working towards my grade 12 diploma, and my greatest achievement is being a role model and a positive support to my children. These have been my biggest milestones, as well as learning the importance of being independent and following through with my short and long-term goals one day at a time, one year sober. I'm Jeremy Rath. I'm half Indigenous and half white. Pieces is an all-new CBC British Columbia original podcast. This is a story of being stuck between two worlds, not really fitting in with either of them. So because I don't have darker skin or long brown hair, that therefore I was not Indigenous. You don't have to be a residential school survivor yourself to be traumatized by residential school. Pieces. Listen to it now, wherever you get your podcasts. Scattered around Metro Vancouver are little community library boxes filled with books for sharing. But what about something similar for man's best friend? Good question. Here's a look at a special project a Saskatoon father and his son have taken on for dogs in their neighborhood. We're here at Avalon Dog Park today uh, on a pretty chilly day. Um, and this is our stick library. So my son and I, Jeremiah, built this stick library a couple of weeks ago. And as you can see from the broken sticks all around the park here, uh, it seems to be a bit of a hit with the dogs in the park. Um, here's a dog here with a stick. <laughs> uh, originally, I saw a posting on social media. I think it was a guy in Australia or New Zealand had made one. I don't know what that was about. And then there's, I saw another one in our neighborhood here on Victoria Avenue and I thought what a great idea to put one in our parks there are always dogs want to play with sticks and uh, often uh, they can't find them so by having a stick library we have a box a wooden box with some perfect dog sized sticks right by the main entrance they can pick one up on their way in and return it on the way out she showed me and it looked really fun and we needed something to do we're calling this a branch uh, and now we've opened a second branch also at Chief Whitecap Park. We'll go to the Chief Whitecap one every once in a while and see how it's doing. It's kind of fun seeing people walking around and talking about it and telling people what it is. Our dog, uh, Nala, is a golden doodle. She's two years old. She's absolutely crazy, uh, although calming down a little bit and loves to play with her. My son's dog, Swiffer, who is uh, some kind of a mix, and so the two of them love coming to the dog park. Lots of dogs have been enjoying grabbing a stick, leaving a stick. We built it out of some old wood, got to learn how to use the nail gun. Well, as you can see, there's quite a lot of uh, sticks all around here. Uh, when we come to the dog park, we often go into the 
woodland area here and pick up some sticks and fill it up. So it's obviously being used quite a bit. Sometimes we need to reload it because some dog will grab like eight at a time and then leave them all over the dog park. So we just need to refill it. Take a stick, leave a stick. <laughs> I know a lot of dogs that would be pretty reluctant to actually give up the stick. So I imagine there'll be a lot of uh, overdue sticks at, uh, at that particular <laughs> I bet. There you go. Just a reminder, you can also watch our newscasts online anytime, cbc.ca slash bc. Dan Burt is here at 11 o'clock after the National with your next local news. Good night, and we're leaving you tonight with the sound of the ice on Okanagan Lake, sounding like chimes, as brought to you by Claude Rio.